Hello my spooky crew and welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if this is your first time here. My name is Alex and thanks for coming to my spooky corner of the internet. So last week I made a reaction video to the second trailer for the new Ghostbusters Afterlife movie and I didn't expect it to take off the way that it did. And also because I was doing a live reaction, I said some things that were a little dumb. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I didn't expect that reaction video to hit like almost 8,000 views. Like, holy cow. Like by the time I made this video, the video was like creeping um, about 8,000 views. Also at the time that I filmed this, I'm only four subscribers away from 2,000 subscribers, which is insane and amazing. So uh, thank you all so much that have subscribed and have joined this little corner of the internet, which, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful. But anyway. Yeah, so crazy stuff. Before I dive into this whole, like, is Ghostbusters a true story? Is it based on true stories? Uh, I do want to address a few things in the reaction video. One, yes, I called a ghost trap a proton pack. <laughs> That's what happens when you react live to a trailer. Like you have a lot of things going on and like you're reacting and you're processing. And I was, I looked at the, the ghost trap and I was like, is that a proton pack? Yeah, totally, totally my, my bad y'all. <laughs> and then let's see, what was the other one? Oh yeah. For some reason I called Carrie Coon Renee Zellweger. Like Renee Zellweger doesn't even look like that anymore. So I'm like, what? I think that, I think those were the big ones. Oh yes. And my confession that I liked the 2016 movie, which apparently apparently is something you shouldn't do. But again, that's a whole other video for another time. And also I'm not like a nerddom fandom uh, channel anyway. I'm a paranormal person. Anyway, so those are the, some of the things I wanted to address from my trailer reaction video. Everyone who has commented, thank you so much for your comments. If you were kind, <laughs> bonus points. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if you weren't kind, then likely I was snarky with you or I flat out ignored you. So yeah, it's weird to have a video do that well in such a short period of time right now, especially since my views range between like 100 to 200 views. Ghostbusters. One of the most common questions I am asked when it comes to Ghostbusters is, is any of that real? And also anytime that I do like conventions like Con Carolinas, Atomicon, uh, there's a lot of different cons over here in my part of the United States. And more often than not, I am on a panel about Ghostbusters in some capacity. Either it's Ghostbusters versus ghost hunting or real ghost busting, real Ghostbusters, like something to that effect because I am a paranormal investigator and I am also a fan of Ghostbusters. I figured I would make a video about it, especially since Ghostbusters is a hot topic right now. This is the perfect time. But before we get started, if you want to join the spooky crew, you can click on that subscribe button. Also give this video a like and click on that notification bell so you'll know when I upload a video. If you subscribe and you don't click on that subscribe button, weirdly enough, uh, you may not ever hear from me again because YouTube is weird. Like that. Also, if you want ghost hunting tips, spooky stories, then head on to my website at thespookystuff.com. I've also written several books about the paranormal, so you'll be able to find all that info on my website. All right, let's get started. I think most, if not all, Ghostbusters fans know by now is that Dan Aykroyd has a family history of psychical researchers, parapsychology researchers, and paranormal researchers. Uh, his great grandfather, yes, his great grandfather, Samuel Aykroyd, was really, really interested in um, psychic research and psychic experiences. And he regularly held seances in his home. And he primarily worked with a medium named Walter Ashurst. So Samuel, Dan Aykroyd's great grandfather, had this keen interest in psychics, paranormal, being in touch with the other side. And that interest went on to Maurice, Aykroyd, who is Dan Aykroyd's grandfather, also, as you know, had interest as well. And they were owners of like journals, like um, like the American Society for Psychical Research, like their journals and all that good stuff. So Dan Aykroyd's family was very, very interested in this stuff. And in fact, Dan Aykroyd's father, Peter Aykroyd, wrote a book. And that book is called A History of Ghosts, The True Story of Seances, Mediums, Ghosts, and Ghostbusters. You can get it on Kindle for like $12. Um, if you want a paperback copy, you're gonna be spending almost a hundred bucks right now. I, I'm, I, I'm guessing it's because of the Ghostbusters 
name being so big right now, everyone's trying to scramble to get a copy of the book. I happened to find mine at a used bookstore. I've been waiting like two weeks for it to be delivered. I read it a long time ago. I borrowed it from a friend. Yeah, it's a great book. It's a really good book. Dan Aykroyd wrote the foreword for the book. So yeah, so Dan took his family's interest and family history and integrated elements of that into the Ghostbusters movies. So there's a lot of things sprinkled throughout the movies that, you know, may be exaggerated or embellished, but they're not completely fabricated. One of my favorites is the Zenicard, Zenicards. So this is uh, what you see in the beginning of the first Ghostbusters movie. Vankman, you know, Bill Murray's character is doing a test. Now, Zenicards, I'm gonna call them Zenicards. Some people call them Zener cards. I say Zener. Vankman was doing a test. Uh, so this is based on testing ESP abilities, but also it's like a probability game too. So if you're a math person, probability is involved with this. So yeah, you have star, square, squiggly line, <laughs> and the cross, and then of course the circle. Yeah, so people will do these tests and you can do them at home too. There's actually worksheets available online where you can test your ESP, your intuition, and check off if you're right or wrong. And you don't even need other people to do this. All you have to do is shuffle the cards, concentrate, guess what you're seeing, cross, and then mark it to see if you're right and I am as psychic as a wet mop. So of course I'm not gonna get it right. But yeah, I love I love these cards, they're great. Uh, they're really good just to have fun with too. And another thing that is true, uh, you know, when we're in the first Ghostbusters movie, um, even like in the second too, they do this a bit, but in the first Ghostbusters movie, you know, after the librarian sees her ghost and everything, um, Vakeman is basically questioning her. And I love how Vankman is the resident skeptic. Uh, you know, every team should have the skeptic. You know, he's asking the librarian if she has any family history of mental incompetence, history of drugs or alcohol. This is actually very typical of what my team will ask our clients. You know, we will say, you know, is there a history of drugs and alcohol? Have you been diagnosed with anything um, like psychologically? You know, because we want to get the full picture and the full story to try to debunk, you know, what may be happening because also we don't want to involuntarily validate someone unnecessarily. So, you know, we'll ask those kinds of questions because we really want to know what we're working with here. Like we don't walk in right away believing the person. Now we go in fully understanding that scary experience was very real to them. And what we're there to do is to help them understand what that experience was. More often than not, it's helping them understand that those footsteps they heard were squeaky floorboards. Of course, we record everything. I mean, we got like our, we got our camcorders, also have an audio recorder. And also I have a full system surveillance set up. So, you know, I got multiple cameras going to a DVD. VR. We have someone watching the cameras during investigations because we want to see everything that's happening. And we can't be in multiple places at once, so those cameras help us record everything. And by the way, in case you're wondering, yes, we do have clients sign liability paperwork. They sign release forms and they sign contracts. Another thing that is pretty true is, <laughs> you know, when, uh, when the guys are seeing the ghost in the library for the first time and they're like, uh, so what do we do? <laughs> That actually happens more often than you think on ghost hunts, especially when, you know, you, especially if you do have a skeptic who has an experience and they're like, uh, what do I do? <laughs> it's like, oh, just go say hi. We rarely say get her or get him. We, we don't do that because more often than not, we lose that contact. All right, let's talk about the tech. So gosh, I, I wish I had an Egon Spengler on my team. Uh, I wish I just had Egon on my team. The PKA meter, Geiga meter, the goggles, proton packs, ghost traps, obviously none of them are real. Any of the tech that we do have as ghost hunters, it's not made to detect ghosts. They're made to detect something else. I guess maybe the closest piece of equipment to reality is the PKE meter. You know, a lot of a lot of paranormal investigators will compare it to a K2 meter. What a K2 meter does, it it detects the levels of electromagnetic fields. This doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, there's a ghost nearby. It just means that the EMF is high wherever we're at. Now, I'm doing a lot of recording. I have a camera, I have a light, and I have a computer over here. So, of course, this is going to be spiking a little bit or moving up and down. So, that's something to consider, but there is a common belief that 
high EMF or fluctuating EMF is tied to spirits. My team, we use EMF meters to determine the, the level of electromagnetic fields. And if there is a high level of EMF, sometimes that does cause hallucinations or feelings of being watched. And a lot of people will assume right away it's paranormal experiences, but really, you might just need to turn off a TV or a computer here and there. Another piece of equipment that, you know, you will see owned by a lot of uh, investigators is the Melmeter. I do like the Melmeter because not only does it detect EMF, that's where that bigger number is, the 0 0.4, 0 0.6, that's the, the level of EMF. And then below that, you'll see temperature. So, and you, oh no, it went to 666 for a second. Oh gosh, joking, I'm joking. So yeah, it detects EMF and temperature. It kind of does two things at once and there's a lot of different things that this little piece can do. So yeah, I guess maybe if there's anything that the PKA meter is similar to, it might be something like the Mel meter or the K2 meter. And then another piece of equipment you might see people have is something known as a spirit box. I don't have a spirit box. I use an old Radio Shack radio. It's a Shack hack. Basically the the mute clip is cut. So when you sweep through the stations, it, it doesn't mute the radio. So it's that machine that goes ch -ch 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 -ch, and it sweeps through the radio stations really quickly. And people will believe, people believe that, you know, ghosts can speak through that. And there have been times I've heard some really weird things on here. Um, even when I'm sweeping through empty radio stations, uh, I tend to go towards the AM, AM frequency because there's less distortion, less disruption. If I go to FM, then, you know, I may hear like, you know, Billie Eilish uh, throughout the sweep. And I don't want to hear Billie Eilish. I love listening to Billie Eilish outside of investigating, not during my ghost hunts. And then of course we have um, like a REM pod type device. Again, this isn't detecting ghosts. We don't know what ghosts are made of. What this is, is it's detecting interruptions in the frequency around it. That's what this, um, that's what this little antenna is for. If I get close to it, it will go off. Sometimes this might go off when I'm not touching it, or if I put it in the middle of the room and it goes off, then okay, that's telling me there is something around the vicinity that is causing it to go off. Is it a ghost? I don't know. Could it be wind? Air doesn't make it go off. So, it's... okay. So really what we're doing is we're detecting changes in the environment. We don't actually have equipment that can detect ghosts. We're looking for changes in the environment and then seeing if there's any correlation with paranormal experiences. Like if someone's feeling like they're being touched, then they, then they hear the REM pod go off. Okay. This is technically called an Octi red pod. So a, a real REM pod is going to cost closer to 150 bucks. Um, that, so, but this and a REM pod, they're, made with theremin kits. You can actually make one of these yourself for like $12 and then just build something around it as a base. So yeah. So we don't have the fancy tech like they do in Ghostbusters that actually detect ghosts, but we do have tech. So a little bit of similarities there. Another part of Ghostbusters that is kind of true is there, there were research programs within universities to study paranormal and parapsychological events. Duke University used to have a parapsychology unit within their psychology department, and that was run by J.B. Ryan. And then once J.B. Ryan left Duke, he actually took the parapsychology unit with him and we have the Rhine Research Center and they're still active. They're still going strong. I'm a sustaining member of the Rhine Research Center. So there are people with scientific backgrounds who are exploring this. They're doing experiments. They're publishing their work in peer reviewed journals. Universities having parapsychology programs, that is definitely not made up. Uh, if you want to study parapsychology in a university setting, more often than not, you're gonna have to go overseas. I know the University of Edinburgh has a parapsychology department under the psychology department. And I know there are a few people who will get their master's degrees or get some sort of certificates from these graduate programs in university. But I actually know some folks who have PhDs, not necessarily in like parapsychology or in the paranormal, but they use a paranormal emphasis in their studies. Like I know someone with a PhD in psychology studying the effect, the psychological effects of EVP on people. That's kind of a loophole, you know, some people will 
will use to still study the paranormal and get that academic credibility. Let's see, what's another thing in Ghostbusters that's pretty legit? Oh, the commercials, uh, you know, the self-promotion. Paranormal investigators are all about self-promoting themselves, mainly because there's so many people in the paranormal community that you have to make yourself stand out sometimes if you want to get work. Work as in you want to get investigations. No one's making money from this. And we do take calls and we do take case submissions. I mentioned earlier my clients have to fill out a form and they have to sign paperwork. We do residential investigations, but you got to sign the paperwork and fill out the forms because I'm not getting sued. And another thing, so in Ghostbusters, they charge for their services. I think they quoted the hotel like $5,000 <laughs> in Ghost in the first Ghostbusters movie. If you charge in the paranormal community today, you are going to get trashed. You're going to get slammed. It's very much frowned upon. You don't charge to help people with their paranormal situations. Also from a legal standpoint, it's really sketchy to charge anyway because you can't prove that your services were fulfilled. So yeah, a rule of thumb, you don't charge. I don't charge for investigations. The only areas where I make money from the paranormal is from my books, YouTube monetization, you know, <laughs> making 50 cents, uh, any sort of like creator fund, like on TikTok, I monetize. That's where I make the money, but I would never charge a client for trying to help them with their haunting. Let's see, an area where where Ghostbusters gets it right to. So, okay, the, the paranormal events that happen to Dana, like the eggs popping and cooking on the countertop, that can be associated with poltergeist like activity. Now for me, I look more poltergeist activity as coming from within, like it's an external response to something happening within. Poltergeist is basically telekinesis and psychokinesis that's out of control. So it's coming from the person, not a ghost. Um, let's see, there's residual hauntings, but Ghostbusters don't really cover residual hauntings. Residual hauntings would be like that leftover energy, like at the Battle of Gettysburg, you know, all that energy that's left over from the battle and you, the, you see a ghost walk across a field at three o'clock clock every day, but he doesn't respond to you. He just walks across the field at three o'clock every day. More than likely that's residual. If the spirit acknowledges you, answers your questions, then we would classify that as an intelligent haunting or a conscious haunting. Uh, let's see the possession aspect when Zool and uh, the other one, the, um, the key, <laughs> uh, the key, the gatekeeper, um, the other one can't, I don't remember their name. Sorry, fans. You know, the pull possession thing, you know, can be accurate. It's a lighthearted take on possession. To me, I don't think uh, it's all demons that can possess. I actually don't know if I really believe in demons anyway. That's a whole other conversation for another time. The way they, that possession is depicted is fairly accurate. Shape shifting. So shape shifting is a big hot topic in the paranormal community. Like, do we even know we're dealing with ghosts? What are we, what if we're dealing dealing with inhuman or elemental spirits that are just shape-shifting. This is why we won't ever prove the existence of ghosts, by the way. <laughs> so many theories and runarounds. But yeah, shape-shifting is a thing in the community too. Very rare, but occasionally pops up. Ectoplasm? Ectoplasm is a big is a big hot topic in the Ghostbusters movies. I don't personally believe in ectoplasm. There are people who do. There are people who do believe in it. Ectoplasm was a big hot thing in this during the spiritualism movement because that gave some sort of tangible proof that there was paranormal activity. But more often than not, ectoplasm in like the Victorian period ended up being regurgitated cheesecloth. Ugh, gross. Let's see. And then, yeah, I mean, libraries being haunted, hotels being haunted. I mean, really anywhere can be haunted. Not saying that everywhere is haunted, but for me, I don't think there are rules as to what could or could not be haunted. So yeah, but yeah, the overall, besides like the tech situation, Ghostbusters is fairly accurate. Now there are some things about Ghostbusters that are definitely not true. One, ghost hunting is never that exciting. More often than not, you're sitting there for eight hours in the dark, and then you might see like, maybe a blip of an apparition or something may fall over that has no explanation, but that's it. You know, we don't really ever see full bodied apparitions right away or ever. <laughs> and we can't catch ghosts and put them in a ghost trap. We can't use proton packs and use the streams to wrangle spirits. And also, 
we're more discreet. Like when I do residential cases, I'm not in like my my team t-shirt or anything like that. We tend to dress like normal people. So we do that because we don't want to draw attention to ourselves. We really want to treat our investigations uh, very, very privately because our clients may not want the neighborhood to know that they have a haunted house. So we're very discreet. So we wouldn't be walking around in like flight suits and our equipment all hanging out unless we were someplace like Gettysburg where ghost hunting is a thing and nothing new. Besides t-shirts, my team doesn't even have uniforms. But yeah, so that's my breakdown on ghost hunting and ghost busters and you know, the true elements surrounding the ghost busters franchise. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, then please feel free to share this with your friends and family who also enjoy ghost hunting and ghost busters. And before you go, don't forget to click on that subscribe button and give this video a like and turn on that notification bell. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you in the next round.